scheduled on time. So welcome to this session, and we will give some introduction about the, how the scheduler works in the Kubernetes. Uh, I'm Wei Huang, I'm from IBM as a software engineer, and this is... Hey everyone, my name is Ravi. I work as software engineer at Red Hat. I focus on scheduling aspects of Kubernetes and OpenShift. So, uh, so first of all, we are talk about how scheduler works in the whole Kubernetes picture. Let's take a very typical user flow. So user create a deployment, and the deployment API request goes to API server. API server does some basic authentication of authorization check, and uh, if that's good, it will position the API object, the deployment API object, to the backend storage ATC. Then, the job of API server is done. Then after that, controller manager, as well as many other components, watch on the API objects they are interested in. For example, controller manager are interested in the deployment, the replica set. So it gets an event that a new deployment is created, but it doesn't have any associate the replica set. So it creates one, and uh, once the replica set gets created, the replica set controller notice the desired state, for example, for this deployment is replica set number equals three, but there's no part yet. So replica set controller creates three paths for them. Then the three paths doesn't have one field set, which is the no name because this is not job of container manager, then it just creates three paths with the no spec as blank as there. Then by this step, container manager's job is done. Then there will be three paths in the system without the name, no name set. Then it's the scheduler going onto the stage. It watches on the paths as well as many other related resources because it not only needs to know the overall view of the whole cluster so that it can make the good decision to put the part onto which node. So it watched the part which doesn't have the no name set, then does some internal magic. I will, I will, I will uh, go to detail into that piece. So it does some internal magic across the cluster, check the cluster which node is the best fit for the incoming node, oh, sorry, for the incoming part. Then it will create an API request to set the node name to that perfect node. And uh, this phase we call it the bind. Then by this step, the job of scheduler is done. Then after that, kubelet will also watch on the path, which has the node name set to exactly its own node. So it will only cares about which nodes, which parts will land on itself, right? Then it will invoke the underlying container runtime, either uh, Creo, KinemDD, or Docker to spin up the real containers. Then it will also do some internal reconcile, internal loop to watch the path to report the path status uh, regularly to the API server. So this is the basic, the whole picture of what happens underneath when user create a deployment, then because we are scheduled introduction, so we focus on this piece. Let's take a look what's inside this black box. So internally, basically there are four big components inside scheduler. The first one is informer. If you are writing CRD or CRD controllers, you may be familiar with this. So this is the component that watch on all the API objects you are interested. And once the uh, API object you are interest, interested get updated, deleted, or created, you get a notification. Then you do your thing. So here in scheduler, we do two, two things. One is to update its internal cache. So that means we don't query the API server every time we need to do decision. Instead, we rely on this internal cache because, some, because you cannot query the API server so many times because scheduling is a high volume thing. You need to do a lot of scheduling in, when it's running. The second thing it does is it builds some specific data structure. 
if you are writing CRD controller, you maybe just use the uh, tools like WorkQ uh, that the client goal provides, right? But scheduler works a little different because you need to make the scheduling decision very efficiently, so it has to rely on some specific data structure to so make uh, efficient decision. So this is the first part, informers. Second part is that is a queue. So basically you can think of it's just one queue, but internally it has some sub queues like active queue, back off queue, unscheduled queue, sort of. And uh, we had a feature called preemption or priority, G8 in 114. And before that, we just maintain a very simple queue, which is the FIFO queue, for seeing first, first out. But after we introduced the priority, we had to manage which part has the higher priority, right? So internally, we have the priority queue. As well as we need to ensure the fairness, it's not the case that the higher priority part always can be retried. We need to sort of back off them to make them sleep a little bit so that the lower part has the uh, chances to be scheduled as well. So internally, the queue's job is maintaining the unscheduled, unscheduling parts properly sorted in the, in, the, in the internal data structure. Then it also works as the part dispatcher. Every time it pops a part from its in, internal uh, priority queue, and the consumer is the main scheduling go routine. So once it gets a part, the main scheduling go routine will do its internal algorithm and as well as logic to decide whether there is, a, is a some room for the part to be laid down or there's no room. Then so two decisions there is the A and B here either put it back to the queue or post the banding request to the API server, which is a set, the no name to the exactly no name. And uh, the first component here is called the banding queue. It's a very simple, just a go routine. But we do it in another go routine, which means it's um, another thread. We did this is because we don't want the binding API request blocking the main process because sometimes the bending takes time. We don't want to that uh, HTTP communication takes out, blocks the main go routine. And uh, by this step, the bending phase, we have some internally called uh, optimistic concurrency. That means by this step, in API server, the bind maybe hasn't finished yet, but internally we assume the part has been assigned to the node. So we update the internal cache. And, uh, but don't panic. If it's failed, the band pair failed, we can get a notification. We then invalidate the cache. So this is the basic, the internal flow of the scheduler. So next, we are focused on the internal algorithm and the logic of how the main scheduler go routine gets apart and how it decides which the best of node is. So basically, there are two phases in, in that box. One is called a, fear, a predicate, also known as filtering. So basically, it has two steps. It goes through some defined predicates. The predicates usually comes from the part, a, part API spec, like how many resources you want, and what's the part affinity is, et cetera, et cetera. So internally, we map those API spec to a different predicate. So it, so we go through every node and uh, get a filter result that passes all the predicates. But if none node is qualified, then we will go to a second try, which is called preemption. To, for the higher priority part, it has the chance to preempt lower preempting priority paths to make room for it. So the little difference here is that uh, if it enters the preemption phase, the result is that it only sets a spec called nominate node to the target node we want to, it to land on and the preempt the pass, then goes to next scheduling cycle because we don't want to uh, 
it to be stable. We, don't, we want it to stay less so that it can better be managed in our internal logic. So this is the phase one. And the phase two is called priority. That means we do have some nails which can fit for the nail. So the phase two called priority, also known as scoring, is that for each filtered node, we have internally have some uh, priorities, and we give score plus its weight to each node on each priority. Then we sum up the score, and finally, the node with the highest score will be chosen. Then we go to the next phase, which the bending phase. Uh, can I give some example? For example, there is a priority called uh, a list requests requested, which means we once a part comes in and there are three nodes available right now, we want to choose the node with less utilization. So we want to balance the workloads. But of course, you can choose the most requested to make the resource more beam packed onto the nodes you want. So different scenarios can use different strategy. Okay, this is basically the scheduling flow in the very high level. So binding, I don't need to mention binding. Binding just send a request to API server. Okay. And the next, we are introduce some recent developments in the default scheduler. So why is that the priority and preemption has been GAD in 114 so that uh, it's a default behavior that high priority, high priority part can preempt the low, preempt, low priority parts. The second one is called resource quota using scope selector. So resource quota applies to the namespace and uh, you can specify that the resource quota is applied to some specific priority class. That is what scope selector comes to. And uh, along with the GA, we also remove the restriction that the system critical priority class can only be applied to the cube system. Right now, you can apply to any namespace you want. Uh, the other ongoing features, I just list some major features here. One is the scheduling framework. So as you know, extensibility is a very important part in the whole Kubernetes community and the uh, schedule is also non-exceptional. And in the before, we do have some extension me mechanism, but this time we want to move one step further. So that's why we bring in the scheduling framework. So basically, we do some code refactoring to basically expose every phase inside scheduler outside so that you can build your own plugins and combine with the default scheduler to make it your own customized scheduler to fit your needs. So, I, so Abdullah will give more detailed introduction in tomorrow's deep dive. So right now, the, this feature has been offered in 115, and in 116, we completed, it's like we are eating our own dark food. We completed the, the code migration from the old style to this uh, framework plugin style. The second one is called Event Path Spread. Uh, in yesterday's keynote, you know, the, the wiki also mentioned that uh, this is one of the features the community asked for a long time. They want to sort of control how the path is spread across your cluster on different topology domains. And uh, uh, Abdullah also will give some detailed examples. And third one is called, uh, it's, uh, extended priority on the, on the requested to capacity, capacity ratio. Uh, the motivation is that for extended resources, we don't provide the option, see whether you want the beam packed behavior or uh, the, uh, the, the even, part, even spread behavior. For example, for some GPU, if there are two GPUs, whether you want the behaviors to use one as much as possible or just use them as average as possible. So this feature uh, gives you uh, the option. You can provide your, your inputs. Okay, so this is basically the recent development. I will handle it to Ravi.
thanks, Wei. So uh, I think this slide should have been the starting slide, but uh, I wanted to set the tone to uh, next part of the presentation where I'll give some updates on, on the, the projects that fall under six scheduling purview. Uh, so I'd like to talk about the design rationale of uh, scheduler, like when we have started designing, what are the goals that we had in our uh, mind. Uh, the first and foremost thing is uh, scheduler is not responsible for managing the entire life cycle of a pod. Uh, so at a high level, when the pod has been bound to a node, the binding stage is done, scheduler's job is, is done. It does not care what happens when the pod is in running state. So this is something that we have made as a choice consciously, and there are some side effects of that. We'll talk about that in a bit and how the, the projects that we that we're going to see are going to handle that. Uh, so the second uh, important uh, thing that we have uh, thought about is uh, the minimum scheduling uh, unit is always going to be a pod. It's not going to be a group of pods or job or some other entity. So it's always the pod that we are interested in, in scheduling. And we schedule one pod at a time. Uh, we also make sure that it's uh, best effort when we are choosing a node for a particular pod. Uh, we could have chosen a first fit approach like greedily. Uh, in the predicate stage itself, we could have exited in the scheduler saying that we found a node that satisfies the resource request uh, for the pod, but we did not do it. We, did not, we wanted uh, the scheduler to provide a best fit for the node. That's why uh, the pod is actually going through the second stage, which is uh, uh, the prioritization of the nodes uh, from the list of nodes that were filtered in the first stage. So that's, that's something that we have made uh, as, a, uh, as a design choice consciously. Uh, and uh, we also wanted to make it configurable, uh, like the end user should be, or the cluster admin should be able to pick and choose whatever uh, the priorities or the predicates that he or she wants for the cluster. This is something that we, uh, that Kubernetes as a whole, as we explained, is interested in, in going towards and scheduler is no exception to that. Uh, the other thing that is uh, kind of uh, different for scheduler is making uh, scheduler pluggable. Uh, so, previously we used to have, uh, or even now we have scheduler extender, which runs at various stages, like you can choose uh, schedule, scheduler extender to be run at the predicates level, or after the priorities level, or after binding. Uh, so, we have gone ahead and taken it to the next level, where we have broken it down, broken, a, broken uh, the scheduling cycle down to multiple stages, like pre-filter, post-filter, filter, and then uh, prioritizing stage uh, where we are ranking and, and all that. So for every phase, we are going to have extensions going forward. And uh, this is what Wei was explaining uh, when he was mentioning that we are eating our own dog food, converting the existing predicates and priorities to uh, this new scheduling framework. Abdullah is going to talk about that in, uh, in the deep dive uh, tomorrow. And the other important feature is uh, multiple schedulers. Like, uh, like as of now uh, in Kubernetes, you can specify within the pod spec which scheduler you would like to you would like your pod to be uh, scheduled by. So that's something that uh, uh, we have thought through, and we thought that it would be uh, good if we can uh, make sure uh, this extensibility is available to the user. So, as I told. Uh, if you go back to the previous slide, the first three points uh, in the design rational, like scheduler is responsible for managing life cycle, the minimum scheduling unit is pod, and schedule one pod at a time. There are some side effects of that. Uh, the first thing is, uh, since scheduling is, uh, or the job of scheduler is done once a pod has been bound to a node, uh, at runtime, like say when the pod is running, there is a very good chance that a new label has been applied to the pod or uh, a taint has been applied to a node, or a toleration has been removed or applied to the uh, pod. So in those cases, the scheduler won't reschedule the pods when they are in running state. So we are in need of an entity which can do that. Uh, this is where descheduler comes into picture. Uh, the other use case for descheduler is uh, ensuring that a cluster is evenly balanced. So you can configure uh, uh, descheduler with some limits. Uh, or the threshold saying that this is the lower uh, threshold and this is the target threshold. Like, uh, for example, you can tell that I would like 30% and 70% as the range of the utilization for every node in the cluster. And when descheduler is run with that uh, particular strategy enabled, it ensures that all the nodes in the cluster are falling within that range. 
so this helps in solving the fragmentation issues in the cluster. So this is another use case for uh, descheduler. Uh, how does this work? Uh, so descheduler at a high level is, is an evictor, meaning it just evicts the pods that are not conforming to the scheduling decisions uh, anymore. And when the pod gets evicted, as, as you know, uh, there are higher level controllers that are responsible for spinning up uh, or recreating those pods. And whenever a new pod gets recreated, it goes through the scheduling cycle again. But nowhere descheduler influences the scheduling cycle by saying, uh, by adding a label to the pod that is evicting or by adding a taint to a node or, or something like that. So descheduler is just an evictor. Uh, some of the strategies uh, that descheduler has uh, include uh, remove duplicate pods. Uh, this is this kind of helpful if you have uh, multiple replicas of a replica set or deployment running on the same node. Uh, it, it makes sure that there is only one copy of that uh, collection running on the node and evicts the rest of them. And the low node utilization is the same example that I was talking about earlier, where you can configure the lower thresholds and the target thresholds and ensure that all the uh, nodes are falling within the range within a cluster. Uh, remove pods violating interpod anti-affinity and node affinity. Both of them are similar to uh, what I was explaining earlier, where we have you have applied uh, the pods, sorry, the labels to the pods, or remove taints from the nodes or added taints from the node. So these are the strategies the descheduler supports. We are also working on other strategies. Uh, like when we are evicting, we will ensure that a certain types of pods are not evicted. For example, critical pods, uh, static pods, uh, the daemon set pods, and pods with local storage. Uh, we also ensure that the QS tiers are respected when we are evicting the pods. Like for example, uh, when we are uh, considering a node, we would ensure that first the best effort pods are evicted, then burstable, and, the, and then guaranteed. And uh, if you notice that uh, a pod's PDB, pod disruption budget, would get violated when we are evicting, we would not go and evict those kind of pods. So uh, that's, that's what descheduler does. Now I'll talk a bit about cube batch. Uh, so if you remember, I, I was mentioning about three different uh, aspects of uh, Scheduler, one is we schedule one pod at a time. The basic scheduling entity is pod. So we, we schedule one pod at a time, but there are scenarios where you would like to uh, schedule five pods or 10 pods at a time. So the default scheduler cannot handle those scenarios currently. That's where cube batch comes into picture. Uh, it ensures that, say if you, if you tell that, I would like all these five pods to be scheduled. You can create a custom resource definition, which tells that this is a pod group, and we need 10 pods to be running, and all of them would be scheduled at the same time. This is uh, kind of helpful for uh, machine learning jobs, and there are like projects like TensorFlow, Apache Spark, and all those uh, projects that are using uh, KubeBatch. This also falls under uh, SIG scheduling purview. Uh, some of the features of KubeBatch are like co-scheduling, fair scheduling, predicates, uh, task preem uh, preemption, and then task priority. Uh, so, the thing that is kind of important for uh, most of the machine learning jobs is uh, co-scheduling. It previously used to be called gang scheduling. We have changed it, uh, changed its name to co-scheduling. And uh, this is where KubeBatch helps in. Uh, the next project uh, that also falls under uh, SIG scheduling purview is uh, Poseidon. Uh, Poseidon uh, is uh, a network flow-based uh, scheduler. The main advantage of using uh, Poseidon when compared to default scheduler is, again, it, it comes back to batch scheduling. It inherently is a batch scheduler. And this takes the batch scheduling to a step further. Like instead of uh, taking 10 parts or five parts at a time, it continuously reevaluates and uh, shuffles the parts or all the parts within the cluster to ensure that all of them are optimally placed. So. Uh, one of the things that uh, this helps in is, again, coming back or going back to what I explained earlier, batch processing. We are also in need of an entity that watches the cluster and then say if a label has been applied or if a label has been removed or a taint has been applied. All those kind of things are not taken into account by a descheduler, sorry, scheduler. And we need external entity like descheduler to uh, help us with uh, those scenarios. Now, with Poseidon, 
since it does a continuous re-evaluation and rescheduling, we would not need that uh, entity like descheduler uh, if we are using Poseidon. Uh, some of the features that Poseidon has are very much similar to uh, default scheduler, uh, like node affinity, anti-affinity, tension and tolerations, and co-scheduling. But uh, it's not feature rich enough at this point, like it's not on par with default scheduler to replace it. So uh, this is all uh, of the projects that are falling in uh, scheduling purview. There, there are like other projects like cluster capacity analysis and other projects. Uh, they are also under SIG scheduling uh, purview. So one of the things that uh, people frequently ask us about is how do those schedulers work? And the answer is, uh, we do not know yet. This is something that we are working on. Like, how can we ensure that we can bring in batch processing capabilities from Cube Batch or Poseidon using the new scheduling framework that we have written? Like, can we use those extension points to call Cube Batch or get the code from Cube Batch to ensure that uh, both batch processing and uh, default scheduler, or the, the schedulers that are capable of providing batch scheduling and the default scheduler can coexist? This is something that we are working on. So, if you have any questions or suggestions, please feel free to contact us. Uh, that is the end of our presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Sure. In a scenario you want, uh, some parts to come in some order, but not just setting a strict priority level or a, a group of all of them in the same group. Like, can we make sure that part one comes first, then part two comes first, part three comes first, and if there, there is a disaster of node being failure, Whenever the nodes become available, they also come at the same order, like critical of one, two, three. Can you do that? Bay, would you like to answer that? So, it's not only a scheduling order, but also the runtime order. Even if scheduling is scheduled, schedule them onto them. So, I think it's sort of more my personal method, it's more a good fit for your specified order into a path rather than different paths. Because in scheduling's perspective, it's just scheduled part by part. And once the three parts you mentioned get scheduled, then scheduler's job is done. But in runtime, it's also the case you can add any random, random part to be executed, right? So, uh, yeah. Just to add to what Wei, Wei was telling, like it's it's mostly at the kubelet level. Like if you look at the kubelet uh, preemption logic that we have currently, it takes into account uh, the priority of the pods. But uh, when it is once the pods are in running state, or once the pod lands onto the node during admission, we do not have this concept of taking priority into uh, consideration. And to be fair, that does not fall under scheduler's uh, realm as such, right? Because we have told that this part needs to be scheduled first when compared to other part. And then it's the kubelet's job to identify, like if there are five parts that needs to be admitted, it needs to find out which part is of higher priority. Usually even if uh, there is another part that has like come up first and there is no resource for higher priority part, kubelet does preemption or it, it's called kubelet preemption, I believe. But there is a feature uh, which ensures that eventually we may reach a stage where this pod would, would come into running when there are no resources. Does that answer your question? Yeah, just some extent, yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, can you explain a little more about the, the difference between batch scheduling and single scheduling and what the trade off here? Yeah. So uh, when we started out, we always wanted to schedule one pod at a time. But it may not be the case. Like, for example, you may need to have, uh, or you may have a scenario where you would. You have a very big data set and you would like to uh, process it parallelly. Like for example, if you have a training data set, you would like to process it parallelly. And you want to ensure that all the pods have come to running state while the processing is happening. Before uh, we, we mo move on to uh, the actual job execution, we would like to ensure that the processing has happened and all the pods that do the processing are uh, coming to running state like as a group instead of one part, and then second part, and then the third part. So this is where batch processing would help in. Like you can take 10 parts, all of them would come to running state, or none of them would come to running state. That is one example, which is called gang scheduling. But batch is like taking a group of parts and then scheduling all of them together. 
Yeah, to, to add something on, on Ravi is, is that default scheduler is not a controller or resource manager. So it doesn't responsible for spin up paths or destroy paths. So comparing some other scheduler. So if we want to bring the batch capacity into scheduler one, one, one option is to call implement the equivalence cache so that we know once we did the scheduling calculation for the first part, we can do reuse the result of other for other parts so that can make it efficient. It's one option, but we try equivalence cache, but it doesn't work as performant as we're supposed to be. Uh, second option is that the scheduler also works as a resource manager, but it's not the case for default scheduler. So we want to see if other ways we can do this so that the scheduler can schedule all of them in one time rather than scheduling one by one. I'm sorry, I did I not understand your question. Can you please repeat? You, you were saying that the batch scheduler includes features for Fersher. Oh, Fersher. Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. um, what I was asking is, what furnace model does it include? Is it a hierarchical model? And how do you express that furnace? How do you express so, uh, ways and tree structures to, to the batch scheduler from the standard? So some, some problems in the batch area are not proper modeled in the default scheduler. So some, some, some problems are actually not only a scheduling problem. For example, fair share or some resource sharing, they might be more need to control at the admission time, right? For example, might need some uh, additional control. For example, if you want to make it sure so that you need to make sure you understand different either namespace or different what kind of part and part the, the relationship, right? But that is why we need some, impose some extra capabilities instead of only focus on the part by part cycle. So we are trying to see whether the scheduling framework can help on us on that. Yeah, this is, otherwise you have to start from scratch to build another scheduler only for that specific kind mm -hmm. of, of what you need. Yeah. So batch work, batch is a complex problem actually. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering if you had any uh, comment on like the scaling uh, of the scheduler. Um, obviously you said that the whole schedule only scheduled one part at a time. Does it, do you see that being a limitation at all? Yeah, the, the current throughput uh, that is documented is 100 pots per second. That's the throughput or the SLA that we uh, support. Uh, we are trying to provide uh, or work on the improvements. Like uh, in 114 or 115, uh, I believe, like we have improved the performance of pod anti affinity by 20x. As of now, we don't see that scheduler is the bottleneck uh, in the entire life cycle of pod. Uh, but if we think or if it reaches a stage where scheduler is actually uh, causing those kind of problems, we would uh, consider working on that. Yeah, the basic answer is we are continuously improving the performance. So very, for very basic workflow, we have a rich, we have already reached 100 plus per, yeah. per second in 5,000 real GCE clusters. And, uh, but in terms of some complex workloads, especially the pod affinity, pod anti-affinity, uh, it's inevitable to, to do some heavy calculation because you, for example, for pod affinity, which is check whether paths can be coexist, right? So that it's not only checked in the paths on the same, on this node, but also check across the cluster. So it's inevitable slower. So you must to be sure that, but we are continually 
improving the data structure, uh, using proper uh, benchmark to to improve on that. Yeah. Using multiple schedulers, you mean? Is it using uh, multiple schedulers or multiple pods uh, in a single scheduling cycle? Multiple instances of the scheduler? No, that is not the direction. That's, no. that's not in. Uh, but we are trying to have, uh, uh, like, we are trying to see if we can fit in other schedulers into uh, default scheduler like using the extinction mechanism that we are talking about. But we haven't decided like what the approach will be yet. That's something that we are going to work on in 118. Yeah. I think we just have like last question, perhaps. No, we can we can stay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just offline. Yeah. That's not going to change at all. The HTTP extender would be in place. I can, I can give a more detailed explanation. Yeah, so the basic answer is we, we will keep them in parallel. Yeah, so we, we, the, want, we will still uh, support the... So basically the... Uh, so basically the extent, how extender works is that you have to start an external process which is the ATP server, so that we expose several uh, stage for you, for default scheduler to interact with your uh, extender. The extender is more a uh, webhook, but that means the communication and the mushroom, the mushroom will take a lot of resources, especially if you have a 5,000 nodes that has a lot of you know, data to transfer and uh, mushroom mushroom. So that is the limitation of the scheduling. But for the framework, we are doing another approach. We are, we are, we are still uh, exposing this point, this uh, different phase. But instead, we want you to implement the plugins, and we provide a very simple interface for you to vendor. So you vendor Kubernetes slash packages, schedulers, blah, blah, and you find out, compile your binary. So all the communication works in the process. So no need to communicate with external things. No, they are different things, they are different things. Yeah, schedule. Uh, for the extender? No, extender we are still working Yeah, the, the HTTP extender, we are not going to uh, touch upon that. But uh, if, if people are interested, I mean, we have like some proposals around, or people have created GitHub issues around, like adding gRPC support and all that. But even, Community is interested. But even using gRPC, the, the cost still exists. So it's, I would say, it's suitable for some uh, small cluster, and you will be a very quick implementation onto your requirement. But for a very large cluster, you have complicated requirement, then try the framework. Schedule framework is available in 17? It's alpha, alpha, yeah. We, our plans in next release, we will use some real examples instead of Hello World to give a standard implementation to know how to use that because it's not that easy comparing to extender. We can just use stock to, to explain. But the framework, we, we must use some ex, uh, good compelling example to describe. Okay, I will, uh, maybe we are wrong, out of time, yeah, I and uh, I will be time, in the corner. We can still answer the questions. questions. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you.